I've been a Firewatch lookout for about a year now. I spend most of my life alone in a small window-lined one-room shack atop a steel and wood-framed tower in the middle of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. My only companions are my collection of cheap novels, a laptop computer with infrequent and unreliable internet service, and the two-way radio I use to communicate with the few other nearby towers and ranger stations. Nearby is a bit of a misnomer, though. Using my high-power binoculars, I can just barely make out Tower 12 on a clear day, situated several miles to my west. Tower 15, the next nearest to my location, only appears as a glint of sunlight to my east, when the sun catches it just right. I've been told the park's department intends to put up some additional towers in this area, as soon as it gets the necessary funding, which is probably no time soon. That's fine with me, though. I like the solitude. It helps quiet my mind. It keeps the memories at bay. Mostly. I occupy most of my days, either with simple maintenance in and around the tower, or else scanning the dense sea of trees all around me for any signs of trouble. It's been a dry year, so the threat of fire is a constant one. This particular afternoon, I was clearing some brush from around the base of the tower. That had begun to encroach on the fire road that led from my tower back to the main ranger station, 20 miles away. Even with the heavy suspension of the government-issued jeep parked nearby, that was a harsh ride in the best of times. I had just finished dragging some brush cuttings off into the tree line, when the radio clipped on my belt squawked. Tower 9. This is Tower 12. How copy? It was Billy Johnson, my supervisor. Nice enough guy, I suppose. Tended to leave me alone most of the time. I straightened up and stretched my back, wiping the sweat out of my eyes with my forearm and keyed the microphone attached to my shoulder. Go for Tower 9, I replied, as I replaced the shears and bow saw to the small storage shed near the base of the stairs. John, do you have eyes on a bit of smoke north of your position? Stand by, Billy, I said, snatching up my water bottle and jogging up the metal staircase that wound its way around my tower. I didn't bother locking the eight-foot chain-link fence that surrounded my little compound. Chances are that I'd be back down here soon enough. Reaching the top, I stepped through the trap door and onto the walkway that surrounded the cabin, closing it behind me. It was habit at this point. The last thing I needed was to take an errant step and tumble down through the open trap door. I'd probably end up breaking my neck. As I passed by, I reached into the open door of the shack and grabbed the binoculars hanging on a nearby hook rounding the railed corner of the walkway and turning my attention to the dark green blanket of trees stretching out before me. I saw the smoke almost immediately. A thin trickle of wispy white haze rose lazily above the canopy some distance off. Probably just some campers, I figured. Though there weren't any approved campsites in that area, we always had more than a few folks every season who decided that camping off trail in the deep bush sounded like a hoot. Most of them come back just fine, obvious to the danger that this wilderness presents to anyone not adequately prepared for its risks. Some of them have to be brought back by search and rescue. Some of them just don't come back. A member of the rangers, or maybe even a random hiker, will occasionally trip across the deserted remains of a campsite and report it in. Those are the spooky ones, The ones where people have just vanished and left behind a perfectly set up campsite. No explanation, no clues, just a deserted clearing, often with perfectly intact tents and personal effects. But there are bears and mountain lions, along with a handful of lesser predators that roam these forests, and sometimes they get hungry enough to store and even kill humans. And that doesn't even take into consideration the much more likely probability that folks step out of their tents at night to take a piss in the woods and very quickly get lost 
and can't find their way back to their camp. Most humans aren't suited to survival in the wilderness, unfortunately. My radio squawked again. Tower 9, what's the word? Yeah, I see it, Billy, I said. Looks to be a couple miles due north of my tower. What's your plan? He asked, and I knew what he was asking. Keep an eye on it and hope for the best, or take a trip over and investigate. After a brief moment's pause, I sighed with resignation. It's probably just a campfire, but I guess I'd better head on over and take a look, just to be sure. I didn't relish the thought of a trek into that area of wilderness, to be honest. It was the only area I hadn't explored during my time here. There weren't many trails headed in that direction, and the ones that did were badly overgrown and too narrow for the jeep. A couple miles hike might not seem like a lot, but when you're out here, alone, the dense trees seem to stretch on forever. Two miles can seem like a hundred. Roger that, John, Billy replied. Take your pack and rifle and check in periodically. Will do. Tower 9 out, I said, replacing the binoculars to their hook and shouldering the red canvas backpack, waiting dutifully in the corner chair. I grabbed the rifle from its rack over the doorframe, checked to make sure it was loaded, and headed out. As I locked the gate behind me, I threw my pack into the back of the jeep and set the rifle beside it. The jeep wouldn't give me too far before the brush made the trail impassable. But if it saved me even a half mile of hiking, it was well worth it. The sun was still high in the sky. I had plenty of time to get there and back before dusk, as long as I didn't dawdle. I started the engine and put the jeep into gear, turning the wheels towards the unmaintained trail to my right. After only a few moments, the trees and canopy obscured any trace of the watchtower behind me. I was actually able to push the jeep farther than I had expected. A pleasant surprise. I was probably a mile along the trail before it shit the bed and a massive pine lay across the path, much too large to go over. The dense underbrush around me precluded the possibility of going around, and I immediately lamented not bringing the chainsaw with me. Cutting it up and wincing the pieces out of the way wouldn't have been too difficult, and would have saved me a ton of trouble. With a quiet curse, I stepped out of the jeep and grabbed my gear from the back seat. I smiled to myself as a quote from a certain fictional adventure-seeking archaeologist suddenly came to mind. We walk from here. Making sure to mark the location of the jeep on my handheld GPS so I could find it again, I stepped over the thigh-high tree trunk and continued along the path. According to the estimate I had made before leaving, the trail I was walking seemed to head in the direction of the smoke, which was a blessing in my book. The less time I had to spend bushwhacking, the better. The trail continued to narrow as I expected, and before too long, I was brushing branches and leaves with my shoulders as I walked. The trees which had been alive with the chitterings and chirpings of animal life back at the tower now seemed muted. The forest around me was growing denser, feeling oddly claustrophobic at times. I checked in with Billy a couple of times, advising him of my progress and promising to maintain periodic checks. He advised me that a weather relay had come in from the ranger station, indicating an approaching storm that would likely reach us before nightfall. A quick check of my watch made me wince. I had already spent more time than I had predicted it would take to reach the suspected campsite. Maybe it was best to turn around and head back. The last thing I wanted was to get caught out here overnight with minimal supplies and in a rainstorm. I wasn't worried, but it sure wouldn't make for a comfortable overnight. If I had been farther from my destination, I probably would have turned back right then. I wish I had. Within another 20 minutes, however, I smelled the faint scent of a wood fire. Not strong, but it was there. 
I was even more certain of what I would find when I reached them. When I stepped out of the now almost non-existent trail and found myself in a sparsely treed area amidst a dozen or so wooden shacks, I halted in surprise. I had reached the base of a hilly rise, covered in heavy forestry, and these old, forgotten cabins looked like they had been some sort of small settlement. Perhaps an old logging camp, I thought to myself. I didn't know this place even existed, and made a mental note to research it when I got back to the tower. I keyed the microphone. Tower 12, this is John. Do you copy? When Billy replied, his voice was staticky and distant. Hey, John... Tower 12. What's your status? I frowned and looked around the towering trees all around me. I suppose I was asking more out of the portable radio than was reasonable. I was lucky I still had any signal at all, to be honest. I found what looks like an old logging or trapping camp, I said, meandering among the decaying and derelict cabins. Most of them had decayed to the point of collapse, and there weren't any with intact roofs. The campfire has to be nearby. I'm going to take a look around a bit more. There was an odd pause before Billy spoke again. What's your current location, John? I glanced at my handheld GPS and relayed my position to him. Another pause. John, I think you should probably just turn around and come back. You don't have too many hours of daylight left, and that storm looks beginning worse. Something in his voice sounded off, but I couldn't quite place it. Nervous, maybe? I don't think I can blame him, though. My safety was his responsibility and the prospect of one of his lookouts being caught out in a storm overnight probably didn't sit well with him. Coincidentally, it didn't sit well with me either, I thought with a smile. You may be right, Billy, I replied, turning around and letting my eyes take in the entirety of the area. I think I'll just head... I stopped, as my eyes caught sight of the bright yellow nylon tent just beyond the last of the structures. Repeat your last, said Billy. I didn't get that. Stand by, Tower 12, I said absently, making my way to what I now realized was a small cluster of three modern tents situated across the central fire ring. The fire had been extinguished, but the embers still smoldered lowly, the source of the smoke. I looked around for the campers, but didn't see or hear anyone. Sleeping bags and electric lanterns were still in the tents, though I couldn't find any backpacks or supplies. Hello? I called out, turning in a circle and trying to pick out any signs or sounds of human life. I'm with the Forest Service. Is anyone here? Nothing but the muted echo of my own voice. I was about to just dump some dirt on the remaining embers of the campfire and call it a day, when I noticed the narrow footpath heading towards the slope. I could see clearly the recent footprints in the soft dirt, heading away from the camp. I keyed the microphone at my shoulder again. Tower 12. This is John. I found the source of the smoke. It's a campfire, all right. Nothing to be concerned about. Billy answered almost immediately. Roger that, John. Head back home. I paused a moment, curiosity pulling me towards the footpath. I'll be heading back shortly, Billy. I just want to check something out first. I wouldn't screw around up there, John. Billy replied, an edge to his voice. Better... Head back now so you can beat the storm. His last sentence didn't exactly sound like a suggestion. Something had him rattled. I hesitated before I answered. Acknowledged, I said, 
knowing full well that I was going to check out the bar for a bit before heading back. Still, I didn't feel like arguing with my supervisor about something so silly. Just a quick walk up that path, and then I'd be on my way. This path was even less established than the one I'd been on when I discovered the camp, but I could clearly see the prints of the campers in the soft dirt as I went. Before long, I emerged into a small clearing, eyes widening with yet another unexpected discovery. The rough-hewn timber that framed the entryway was set into the near-vertical slope of the hill face before me. It created a dark tunnel entrance that had been sealed off with a heavy iron gate many years before. Likely the park service to keep inquisitive hikers from falling to their deaths in an old abandoned mine shaft. So, it had been a mining camp, not a logging camp. Huh. I didn't know there were any mines anywhere near here. Hell, I'm not sure what they would have been mining for. Coal, maybe? Gold? Did they even have gold mines in Tennessee? Who knows? Certainly not me, clearly. Regardless, now that the gate stood wide open on its hinges, the remains of a rusted chain and antique padlock laying in the dirt nearby. Hell, now I couldn't just turn around and leave. Not if these dumbass campers had decided it would be fun to explore a closed and restricted mine entrance. Towerswell, this is John. Do you read? Billy probably wouldn't be happy that I had continued my exploration after he told me to head back, but there was nothing to do about it now. I wasn't equipped or trained for any sort of cave exploration or rescue. The rangers had very specialised teams for that sort of thing but I could at least poke my head inside and see if I could hear the campers, nor at least confirm that they actually went inside. No answer from the radio. I tried again with the same results. Nothing. I tried a different approach. Tower 15, this is John from Tower 12. Do you copy? I said into the radio. I figured I might be able to at least get Nathan's attention if I was out of range of Tower 12. There was a burst of static that sounded like it might have contained the hint of a human voice, but it was too distorted and distant to make anything out. There was only a moment of indecision before I made up my mind. I knew it was reckless to go into the mine, especially when my supervisor was under the belief that I was currently on my way back to the tower. But I just had this nagging intuition that something might be wrong with this whole situation. Maybe someone was hurt and in need of help. I couldn't just leave them there, knowing that I might be their only chance of rescue. In retrospect, I should have turned back and called it in to the ranger station. They could have mobilized the SNR teams that specialized in cave rescues. I should have, but I didn't. I pulled my powerful LED flashlight from my pack, turned it on, and headed into the pitch black darkness of the mine entrance. The walls and floor had been smoothly carved many years ago, which made my footing uneventful, and the tunnel itself was mostly a straight shot. Several times during the first few minutes, I turned back to watch the bright square of daylight at the entrance gradually shrink to a pinpoint of light. By the time I had taken the first dogleg turn of the tunnel, I was in complete darkness. It was a very strange feeling, oppressive almost. At one point I turned off my flashlight experimentally, but after only a few seconds, I quickly flicked it back on. In that time, my heart had been pounding in my chest, and some primal fear had begun growing inside of me. I took a moment to calm myself. The darkness was absolute. It was almost as if you could feel it pressing in on you. My footsteps seemed much louder than they should have on the dirt floor, and the air was beginning to grow cold and damp the further I went. After another hundred feet or so, the smoothly carved tunnel ended abruptly in a wall of rubble. 
I couldn't tell if it was a cave-in at some point or if this was simply where the miners stopped digging and hadn't bothered to remove the debris. But either way, it certainly appeared to be the end of the line. And then I saw it. I almost missed it because of the way the light and the shadows played over the head-sized rock strewn before me. But when I looked closer, I realized I was looking at a ragged hole in the wall. It was only five feet across or so, and definitely didn't look like the deliberate formation of the tunnel I was standing in now. It almost looked like the miners had broken into a natural void of some sort. Interesting, but there was no way in hell I was going in there. I was definitely not trained or outfitted for any sort of spelunking trip, and it didn't seem the sort of thing suited to the learn-as-you-go method. Just as I was turning back to make my way out of the mine, I heard the distant sound of voices echoing from the opening in the stone wall. The sound was faint and may have just been my imagination, but I didn't think so. Hello? I called, pressing my face into the black abyss of the hole. Can you hear me? I'm with the park service. I'm here to help you. Nothing. The air from beyond the breach was cold and smelled stale. Old. Wrong. I felt as if I didn't belong here. None of us did. There was a long moment of unbroken silence. And then I heard a voice again. Closer this time. Did you hear that? It said, presumably to a companion. It sounded like a young woman, nervous, uncertain. Hello? Is someone in there? That settled it for me. I carefully crawled through the opening and into the space beyond, shining my light around. I found myself in a small natural chamber, maybe thirty feet across, and with an uneven ceiling of jagged rock that barely cleared my head. The first thing that caught my attention was the cracked lantern laying on the ground. It looked old, very old, maybe a hundred years or more. A thick layer of grime and age covered its soot-blackened tin surface, and the glass was thick and uneven. Beside the askew lantern was a small, leather-bound book, partially buried in the dirt and dust, with a mouldering leather strap securing it closed. It looked like a journal, and without a thought I tucked it into my backpack, raising my light back up to scan around the room. Hello? I called again. I couldn't hear the voices anymore, but the narrow beam of my flashlight illuminated another tunnel in the far corner of this room, mired in darkness. Can you hear me? Once again I got that feeling that something wasn't right. Then the voice came again, closer this time. Did you hear that? Hello? Is someone in there? She asked, her voice trembling with apprehension. I hesitated, frowning. Something didn't seem right about the voice, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Before I could summon my words to respond, another voice yelled out. This time it was clearly the voice of a young man. We can hear you moving around in there. Please help us. We're lost and our friend is hurt. Hear me moving around in there? I was shouting to them. I sure as hell wasn't trying to hide. Can they not hear me for some reason? I stepped forward to the secondary tunnel and raised my voice again. I'm with the forest service. Can you follow my voice? It was then when I reached out to steady myself against the wall of the tunnel entrance, that my hand met something wet, and I recoiled in disgust, thinking I had just grabbed a handful of some subterranean slime. When I shone my light on it, however, it became very clear the reality was far worse. Blood. I stepped back, 
trying to keep the panic that was fighting to take control of my rationality at bay. I needed to keep a level head now. Panning my light around, I saw an astonishing amount of blood painting the wall and floor in front of me. Somebody had definitely been hurt, and badly. With blood loss like this, I wasn't sure I'd be able to stabilize them long enough to get rescue in here. What the hell happened here? And why did the hikers continue into the cave after one of them was injured this badly? Unless they'd lost their light and gotten turned around, there was no way for them to get lost. There hadn't been any branches to this tunnel since I'd first entered. All they had to do was turn around and walk until they saw daylight. The man's voice called again, coloured with the unmistakable tinge of fear. What the fuck is that? Hurry up, Becky. Take my hand. He seemed to be getting closer, at least. If I could guide them to my voice, maybe I could get them out of here, and get to higher ground and radio for rescue evac. They had a helicopter permanently stationed at the main ranger station. It could be here in 20 minutes if I was able to reach them. The woman's voice came again, and this time I froze. Did you hear that? Hello? Is someone in there? All at once it hit me, and the indescribable unease I had been mostly successful in repressing now fought back with renewed vigor. I realized at that moment what I had missed previously. The woman had repeated herself twice more now. No change in her inflection. No variation in emotion or urgency. It was exactly the same, down to the syllable. It was like I was listening to a recording. What the fuck is that? Repeated the male voice, now even closer. Hurry up, Becky. Take my hand. Below the words, I thought I could hear the stealthy sliding of something soft over rocks. It seemed like it wasn't too far beyond the tunnel entrance now but I wasn't going to wait for it. I didn't think that what I'd see emerge from the darkness would be a couple of college kids who'd had a rough time of it during a weekend camping trip. Now allowing my panic to run free, I turned and threw myself through the cave breach and landed roughly on the flat stone floor of the mine shaft beyond, skinning my hands to hell and banging my knee on a rock. Scrambling to my feet with a hiss of pain, I ran as fast as I could, not realizing until I finally burst into the waning light of the late afternoon light that I had lost my rifle somewhere in that cave. It was darker than it was when I had first entered the mine, and a quick glance to the sky showed the angry black thunderheads that had moved in as promised, but much faster than I had expected. I quickly swung the iron gate closed on screeching hinges and looped the chain between the bars as tightly as I could, securing it rather lamely with the hasp of the broken padlock. I stood there a long moment, bent over and hands on knees as I tried to catch my breath outside of the main entrance. When I felt the first drops of the coming storm on the back of my neck, I straightened and looked through the bars of the gate into the ominous darkness beyond, realizing how ridiculous my barricade really was. It wouldn't do much good if something tried to get out, but at least it made me feel a little better. Until I heard the voice, echoing from the mine shaft, getting closer. It was unmistakable, uncanny. Hello, can you hear me? I'm with the park service. I'm here to help you. By the time dawn arrived the next morning, I had climbed down from my temporary shelter in the low boughs of a red cedar and tried to work out all the painful kinks from my stiff shoulders and neck. The night had not been kind to me, but I was alive, which is more than my fear-stressed mind expected after yesterday. The night had been harrowing. There was no better word to describe it. 
The rain hissed among the trees and stung exposed skin angrily, driven by the banshee wail of the wind rushing through the forest, and was accentuated by the chaotic flashing of lightning and heart-stopping crack of thunder. Because of this relentless chaos, it's difficult to say with any certainty, but throughout the night, I thought I heard something large trying to move stealthily in the forest near my shelter. I say trying, because it felt like whatever stalked through the underbrush was more at home in the unnatural stygian gloom of a cave than under the watchful eyes of nature. Of course, it could just as easily have been my imagination. When the first dim light of dawn started to illuminate the sodden and dripping forest, I spent the better part of twenty minutes straining my eyes with every ounce of concentration as I scanned the grey woodlands around me. I was only ten feet or so above the ground, but there was no way I was going to step foot from my hide until I was absolutely certain I was alone. Once I was satisfied that I was alone for the moment, I climbed down to the muddy ground. I tried the radio several times throughout the night and into the morning, but I wasn't able to get even a burst of static that might indicate someone was trying to respond. A combination of the storm and interference from the trees worked against me. My first thought was to get back to my jeep as quickly as possible, and run every drop of gas out of its tank, trying to get as far away from this place as I could. When I checked the GPS to see how close I was to its marked position, however, I found the unit unresponsive, and with a disastrous crack across the screen, that seemed to mock my dismay, probably caused by my less than graceful scramble from that damned cave. No rifle, no radio, no GPS. Perfect. I still had a compass and the rising sun to guide me though, and that was something. I was only a couple of miles from my tower, which should have been somewhere due south of where I stood. I knew that once I got close, I should be able to either find the service road or the tower itself, so there wasn't much danger of getting myself lost at least. There was a small comfort, but one I gladly took. I moved through the trees and undergrowth with more speed and recklessness than I probably should have. An ankle broken by an errant misstep would have been bad news. Still, even though I hadn't heard or seen anything of my late night visitor, I couldn't help but feel like I was being watched. You know that creeping sense of dread you feel when you've just turned the lights off in a basement and now have to climb the stairs back to the light of the doorway? or when you're making your way from your car in a darkened and lonely parking lot. It's the feeling that something is there. Something much more suited to the dark than you are. It's the same feeling that pushed my footsteps almost to a jog, as I traversed the uneven ground and storm felt detritus that tried to hinder my passage. For the next hour, I moved at this pace, Aware with every rasping lung full of breath that I should pause and rest for a few minutes, knowing that pushing myself to fatigue would only increase my chances of falling or hurting myself. I imagined myself lying in blinding pain next to an unseen chuck hole, clutching at a broken leg and watching as the sunlight began to dim with the onset of dusk, waiting for whatever haunted my trail to find me. What would happen then? Would I even have time to look on its visage before it struck? Did those campers in the cave? A misstep and stumble that nearly made this nightmare a self-fulfilled prophecy jarred me back to the present. Against all instinct, I forced my pace to slow. First to a trot, then to a walk. Then, reluctantly, I stopped completely trying to catch my breath while I scanned the dense woodland around me. Nothing. No, not nothing. As my heart began to slow, and my breathing returned to a more manageable cadence, I turned my gaze back in the direction I had been headed. 
and an unconscious smile found its way onto my lips. The sun had risen high in the morning sky during my flight, and now I caught the flash of its reflection on the windows of my tower, not two hundred yards directly ahead of me. I laughed aloud with relief, fully aware that the fear-tinted eruption was closer to the manic cackle of lunacy than anything else. I didn't care though, and my feet started forward again on their own, quickly reaching a brisk pace. A few minutes later, I burst out of the trees into the maintained clearing surrounding my tower, feeling the full sunlight on my face for the first time since yesterday morning. Had it only been a day? It seemed like longer. I was so filled with relief that I didn't even register the fact that a forestry department jeep sat parked near my fence and closed tower until I started entering the combination into the gate lock. The faded white 12 emblazoned on the corner of the windshield told me that it was Billy's jeep, which wasn't much of a surprise I realized after a moment. After not hearing back from me, I was more surprised I hadn't returned to find an entire SNR team making preparations to search for their lost puppy. I punched the four-digit code into the mechanical combination lock on the gate and stepped through, making sure to close and lock it behind me. I stood there a moment, staring through the tall chain-link fence at the dense tree line, wondering if something waited just out of sight in the shadows, staring back at me with hungry anticipation. I shook myself of the sudden chill as best as I could and made my way quickly to the staircase, taking them two steps at a time. Billy was going to be pissed at me, I was sure, but the fort was a fleeting one that didn't take purchase. His displeasure was the least of my concerns right now. When I reached the top, I threw open the trap door and suddenly found myself looking down the muzzle of a very large rifle. Even in that brief moment of abrupt shock, I couldn't register how the barrel trembled in the hands of its agitated master. And I wonder how close I came to having my life ended in a bright flash of light. The moment only lasted a second or two, and then Billy hastily swung the rifle away in a safe direction. Damn it, John! He exclaimed, his tone an incongruous mixture of relief and fear. I almost shot you! I stepped fully through the trap door and let it drop close behind me. Jesus, Billy! I breathed, leaning back against the railing. I suddenly felt weary and realized it was most likely the adrenaline now rushing from my system that had kept me moving at such a hurried pace throughout the morning. Where the hell have you been? He demanded, stepping back inside my shack and taking a chair at the small table in the center of the room. I noted with mild interest that he kept the rifle leaning against the table beside him, instead of stowing it in the rack over the door, but decided not to comment on it. Billy Johnson was in his middle years, maybe 45 or so, with a bit of a gut and greyish-brown hair trimmed close. He wore an impressive moustache that reminded me of something of an Old West gunslinger might groom. He was dressed in typical attire, khaki forestry service shirt and brown cargo pants. In addition to the rifle I'd had the unfortunate opportunity to closely examine a moment earlier, I noticed that he wore his 500 Magnum in a holster at his side. That wasn't too unusual when out in the bush. Bears and mountain lions can sneak up on you unawares. Having a hand cannon within easy reach goes a long way towards taking the fight out of them if necessary. It was a little unusual for a drive over to another tower, I supposed, but not exceptionally so given the circumstances. I took the opposite chair, dropping my pack to the floor next to me. I realized my legs were still shaking anxiously, and I placed my hands on my knees to try and calm them. He was trying to deflect, but he was horrendously bad at it. He knew something. I was sure of it. You know where I've been, 
I replied, gambling on instinct. I watched his face closely for a reaction, and wasn't disappointed when he winced and turned his focus out of the window and over the forest to the north. I told you to abort and head back to your tower, he stated brusquely. But you just had to feed that curiosity of yours, didn't you? You're damned lucky to be alive. You know that. From my chair, I reached under the cupboard to my right and pulled a half-empty bottle of Jameson and a couple of mostly clean glasses. Billy turned his head and raised an inquisitive eyebrow. Alcohol was a no-no up here. When I poured and handed him one of the glasses, however, he accepted it without a word. I took a pull from the other. It's my own damn fault, I suppose. He continued, turning back fully to me. It's been so long since anyone's even thought of Camp Leclerc that it didn't even click for me when you told me where you saw the campfire. I took another drink and then poured a bit more of the whiskey. Camp Leclerc? You mean that old mining camp? I asked. Logging camp, actually. He corrected me. The mine was there long before the East Atlantic Logging Company set up out there. Nobody knows who dug it. Hell, nobody even knows when it was dug. A long time before the 19th century, at least. Camp Leclerc was established in 1872, and the mine was old, even before that. He looked at me in earnest for the first time since I'd returned and frowned. You look like hell, John. Hm. Got caught in the storm, I'm guessing. Hell of a storm. I only raised my eyebrows, as if to say what an understatement that was. Billy nodded, knowingly, and took another swallow. Did you find the campers at least? I shook my head, and turned to look out of the window to the north, where I could almost envision the black void of that mine entrance staring back at me. No, I tracked them to the mine, but lost them in the cave. I jumped when Billy's glass hit the floor and was out of my chair before I even realised it. Billy hadn't moved from his seat, but now both hands were splayed on the table before him, as if to steady himself. His pale blue eyes were wide and fixed on me. You went into the cave? He said, a sudden and horrifying realisation dawning on him. It was then I realised my mistake. He hadn't known. He thought I had just discovered the camp and the mine and then got caught in the storm overnight. A close call, but nothing that couldn't be undone. Yeah, I replied, nodding slowly and deliberately. Yeah, I went into that cave looking for the campers. The gate had been cracked open already. Not sure when or by who. I leaned forward in my chair and stared at him, hard. Billy, there's something in there. I think it got those campers and I think it followed me out. Billy Johnson's face had gone white then, and I thought for a moment that he might pass out. He scooped his glass up from the floor with numb fingers and poured himself another splash of whiskey, downing it in a gulp. When he spoke again, it seemed far away, distant. Kuwatami. That's what the Chickasaw called it. And they were here long before we ever were. Angler is what the white man called it, among other names. Kuwatami. He nodded. False brother. Lying man. Or something like that. Hell. I don't know. What do I look like? A translator. It means bad. No matter what language you speak. It means something is out there that isn't supposed to be. Something that was locked away a long time ago. And forgotten. It was then that he stood and grabbed his rifle. As if suddenly remembering something. I, I need to get back to my tower and make a call. 
now. I gestured to the radio base station sitting patiently on the table near the door. Why not just use mine? Billy shook his head. Sorry, John, but it doesn't work that way. Special phone, special number. I just hope I'm not too late. I started to stand. I'll go with you, I said. He pointed a stern finger at me and narrowed his eyes. No, you stay here. Strap on your handgun and make sure it's loaded. His voice was calm, almost cold, and didn't leave much room for debate. Still, I had no desire to stay here alone with whatever this angler thing was roaming around out there. Billy, I can go with you. I can help. I started to argue, but was quickly cut off when he took a menacing step towards me, and I realized quickly how much I'd underestimated him because of his normally easy manner. You will stay in your goddamn tower, and you will follow your orders, he roared, and I unconsciously took a step back and reclaimed my seat, only managing a shaken nod in acknowledgement. He took a trembling breath, pointed at the radio, and said in a slightly less terrifying tone, And keep that thing on. As soon as I'm back at my tower, I'll radio you with updates. A moment later, he was gone, and the trap door slammed shut behind him. I stood and retrieved the pelican case from under my cot. Inside was the same model of 500 Magnum revolver that Billy had been wearing, heavy and cold in my hands. I loaded it and belted it on the leather holster, feeling the reassuring weight tugging at my waist. John. I heard Billy call from below and went outside to the walkway, leaning over the railing. He was standing beside his jeep fifty feet below, shielding his eyes from the bright sunlight as he looked up at me. Make sure to keep everything locked. I'll come back for you. He shouted. I raised a hand to him and slid the latch shut on the trap door with my toe. I turned back into my shack as I heard Billy's jeep fire up and a moment later drive off down through the rough service road towards his tower. I glanced back to the north and to the place where I had first seen the campfire smoke rising the day before me and suppressed a shudder. I was alone again, safe in my tower and armed, but alone. Abruptly, like an unexpected wave of nausea, the feeling that I was being watched washed over me with a chill, making the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. I looked back over my shoulder to where Billy had been only a minute before, but saw only the rough surface road and dense impenetrable tree line beyond that. Probably just my imagination, but the feeling didn't diminish, and with every passing breath, I was more and more certain that there was something nearby, just out of sight, standing stone still in the grey-green foliage, waiting I stood there a long moment, eyes straining for any hint of movement or alien shape among the shadows. But if it was there, my human eyes weren't sharp enough to pick it out. I stepped back through the open doorway of my shack and dropped down into the chair again, my eyes catching the bottle of whiskey before me. I was tempted to pour another drink to help settle my nerves but I could already feel the tickle of a buzz at the edges of my mind from what I had already drank, and quickly decided that the last thing I needed was for all my reflexes and awareness to be dulled right down. I'd made more than one poor decision in the last 24 hours. I didn't think adding another to the pile was such a great idea. Grabbing the bottle, I screwed the cap back on, and reached to return it to the sparse cupboard to my right. As I did so, my boot caught my pack, knocking it over. Without a thought, I reached down to move it out of the way, 
and then remembered the old weathered journal tucked inside the front pocket, the one I'd found in the cave. I reached into the unzipped front pocket. For a frustratingly alarming moment, my searching hand couldn't feel anything in the compartment, and I feared that I had lost it in my chaotic escape. But then my fingers brushed the familiar shape, and I withdrew it, setting it out in front of me on the table. I could see the book much more clearly now in the daylight. It wasn't overly large. A little larger than my hand, and maybe the thickness of my thumb. There were no markings on the front, except for a simple grimy brass loop that secured the leather strap holding it closed. I wasn't sure I wanted to see what was inside, but I needed some answers. Anything. A stray sound from the trees below rose to my ears, and I froze, listening intently for more, but none came. The forest around me was silent again, and I turned my attention back to the journal, pulling the strap free from the cover and turning to the first page. From the pocket of Andrew Robinson, it read. The writing was neat and compact, and distinctly male. The ink was a rich black scrawled upon brittle yellow pages, and though faded with the years, was still mostly legible. I turned to the next page where the entries began. I felt as though I had dropped into his account midway, as though this was just the latest in a series of journals that this Andrew Robinson had been keeping. 23rd of July, 1891. After nearly a week of hard, overland trekking, we reached the abandoned camp late this afternoon, exactly where the old trapper said we would. Sequahi, our Pawnee tracker has once again astonished me with his overland navigation skills. I must admit, I was sceptical at the yarn the old trapper had spun in the crowded confines of the common house in Dun Creek, especially after I smelled the liquor on his breath, but the professor never doubted a moment. The man's instincts for reading human character are absolutely singular. The camp looks to have been abandoned, and I have to admit to a certain unease as we inspected the rough cabins. There isn't a soul to be found, and it looks years abandoned, yet everything stands as if awaiting the logger's return at any moment. Strange. 24th of July, 1891 Our small troop of intrepid adventurers made camp in the centre of Leclerc last night. Though the cabins likely would have been more comfortable, I doubt any of us would have felt at ease intruding upon them. Richards laughed it off when someone mentioned how peculiar it was that the loggers had departed in such a hurry that they abandoned their personal possessions, but I could see in his eyes that he felt it was odd as well. Sequahi, our ever courageous and stolid guide, seemed ill at ease and unusually withdrawn refusing all conversation and only responding to queries with quiet grunts. Something of concern hides behind his eyes. I wonder at what it is. Only the professor seems unmoved by the unusually still atmosphere of this place, and his typically infectious positivity keeps working at our unease, keeping it from expanding beyond its current state. Today we spent much of the day exploring the area surrounding Camp Leclerc, and the sunlight was nearly spent when Dobson burst back into camp with news of his discovery. We, all of us, raced at a moment's notice behind him as he led us down an ill-used and nigh-invisible footpath. That led ever ascending upon the side of the northern rocky slope. When the path terminated, we were deposited before a truly curious sight. A barricaded tunnel entrance had been bored into the rock face by some unknown hands. I suspect some sort of exploration tunnel or adit dug in search of precious ores, especially given the nation's more recent history with gold fever. The wooden barrier that had been roughly assembled from a hodgepodge of heavy timber beams was curious, and several of our group commented on it. 
but the professor dismissed it as a triviality, so the matter was dropped. It is far too late in the day to proceed further. But we plan to penetrate the barricade and enter the tunnel in the morning. The excitement among the men is palpable. 25th of July, 1891 Sequahi is gone. He took his supplies and his prized Winchester rifle and fled sometime during the night, like a phantom. This is a shocking blow to us all, but none more so than the professor, with whom the Pawnee Tracker had partnered for a number of years across much of the eastern states. We have no explanation for his sudden desertion, and it sits unwell with the entirety of the group. The overall mood has darkened, I fear. Still, we must push onward. 25th of July, 1891. Addendum. It took more than two hours of hard labor, but we were finally able to gain entrance to the mine shortly before noon today. Richards managed to get his boot caught between two heavy timbers as he stumbled forward, straining his ankle with a terrible cry. We feared it broken, but Dr. Franklin assured us that the bones seemed intact. Regardless, Richards was taken back to the camp, where he will convalesce while the rest of us make our entry. His part in our exploration has come to an end for now. We made our way in a single file through the added tunnel, for some way, before reaching its carved end. The light from our oil lanterns providing regrettably inadequate illumination over the rocky surroundings. When we reached the terminus of the mine tunnel, our hearts sank for a moment before the professor gave an exclamation of discovery and suddenly disappeared through a nearby hidden rift in the wall, surrounded by jagged rocks. We eagerly followed him through, careful of our footing as we went, and found ourselves in what I can only assume to be an accidental breach by the miners into a natural cave system. The air was chill and moving, but our excitement at the discovery allayed any concerns of discomfort this might have caused. The professor directed us to set a secondary camp in this new chamber, which will be used as a staging point for further exploration. So we spent the rest of the day bringing supplies from our main camp and constructing a smaller version in this moderately sized chamber. By the time we completed this endeavour, the efforts of the day precluded a start to the exploration until the group had the opportunity to rest and replenish their energy. I feel I will sleep well tonight, despite the anxious excitement buzzing around my mind. 26th of July, 1891 Another shock when we awoke this morning. O'Connor is gone. The Irishman, who has ever been reliable and as constant as the North Star, was assigned first watch last night. There is no trace of him, and no indication that he took any provisions or even his personal rucksack with him. I fear his natural inquisitiveness may have gotten the best of him, and led him to explore the deeper caverns beyond our ad hoc base camp, for his lantern is the sole item that has gone missing with his person. The professor immediately rallied the rest of our small group, seven in all now, and mounted a search for our lost companion. I tried to caution him against rushing into action, but he was not to be deterred. To my dismay, I was the sole man ordered to remain here at the camp, whilst my companions took up their supplies and launched deeper into the cave system in the event young O'Connor returned in their absence. I was understandably disappointed, but grasped the logic of it well enough. I would loathe to think of O'Connor returning, only to find us all gone, and then losing himself again trying to find us. I shall endeavour to rest a bit. With luck, my companions will return before long, with our lost compatriot. 27th of July, 1891 I am at my wit's end, and am unsure how to proceed. It has been more than a day since the professor led the rest of the men in search of poor O'Connor, I have felt their absence as keenly as I am aware of my own solitude in this cave. I have seen nothing of our missing companion, or of the party that delved deeper into the system yesterday morning. 
and I know their lanterns did not have sufficient fuel to carry them this long. Without other means of illumination to guide their return, I fear they are hopelessly lost. I, myself, had to return to Leclerc for more lantern oil for my own waning light. I must admit, with no little embarrassment, some reluctance to my return to this dark place, which no longer carries any of its former adventurous excitement or fascination. It is now nothing more than a doorway into the deep places below the earth, where men were never intended to tread. But the growing apprehension is not the worst of it. The sounds. By heaven's grace, the sounds. I first became aware of them last night, as I dimmed my lantern and tried to set myself to sleep. At first, it was only an indistinct and muted echo that may have been interpreted as nothing more than the distant whistle of wind or other natural sound distorted by the unique acoustics of this place. But then, I heard the distinct tonal qualities that could only be a man's voice. I instantly rose and took up my lantern, raising the flame and rushing to the entrance of the cave that had swallowed my companions. There I stood, listening with such keen focus that I felt beads of sweat upon my brow. I would swear upon a holy book that it was the distant calls of the professor himself, and I eagerly called back with as much fervor as I could summon, hoping desperately to guide them back to me. However, the instant I called out, the voices vanished, and I was met only with the suffocating silence of an open tomb. There I stood, straight as a sentinel, praying for a response from my friends. After several minutes of absolute silence, my thoughts began turning to dark things. I became painfully aware that anything beyond the weak cast of my lantern would be utterly invisible to me, but I, on the other hand, would be lighted as a beacon to it. I pushed these thoughts from my mind as forcefully as I could, inwardly chastising myself at seeing ghouls where none existed. Nan was about to call out again to my lost companions. When I heard it, the voice came again, echoing from the claustrophobic abyss that lay before me, mired in the blackest darkness one could imagine. It was still some distance away, I estimated, but I was certain it seemed closer now. The third time I heard it, I was just barely able to make out the words but it was enough to be sure. My own words echoed back to me from the depths of that damned cave, and in my own voice. I staggered and nearly dropped the lantern at that moment. Could the legends be true? The professor always seemed to believe them, though I must admit, I attributed his faith to the unwavering certainty he held in those things lost to antiquity. He had always maintained that a legend, especially one whispered by so many indigenous people without mutual contact, must have some root of truth in it. But that line of reasoning is antithetical to modern civility, and I must reject it and focus on the more probable explanation. That my already stressed nerves were turning my fears against me. The voices must be those of my companions, lost in the dark but near enough to hear their calls. They must be. I am not certain what lies next, but I know that I cannot abandon my companions, my friends, to wander the darkness until they fall from exhaustion or dehydration. Not while I might yet help them. I will leave this written account at the entrance to the cave. This lantern is nearly spent, but I have another with a full vessel that I would take in its stead. If I do not return, at least someone may know of our passing here. May God be with us all. I closed the journal with a trembling hand, momentarily lost in what I had just read. How was it possible? The journal was more than 130 years old. No animal alive then, 
could be what pursued me now? What if it's not an animal? The sudden burst of static from Billy's call that simultaneously erupted from my radio base station and the portable handset clipped at my shoulder made me jump and drop the journal on the floor. Heart pounding, I cursed under my breath and keyed the microphone. Go for Tower 9. I answered, my voice tight. As I spoke, my eyes drifted out across the sky to the east, where darkened thunderclouds had been unknowingly gathering and marching slowly in my direction. I shook my head. Icing on the cake, I thought. John, what's your position? Asked Billy. The self-assured authority that had filled his tone before was strangely absent now, replaced with something else. Fear? I frowned a moment at the question before answering. Where do you think I am, Billy? I'm in my tower, just like you told me. A strange pause before he spoke again. John, this isn't some sort of joke, right? You're not outside of my tower? I was growing more agitated by the moment. What sort of a question was that? I had no jeep. There was no way I could have made it to his tower in such a short amount of time. Even if I'd wanted to. No, Billy. I answered, with more force than I'd intended. I'm not outside of your fucking tower. What? I stopped mid-sentence. A horrified realisation sweeping over me in that moment. I tried to speak, but my mouth had gone dry. Billy? was all I could muster. The radio was silent, as my eyes slowly drifted to the west, where I could just make out the small, lonely shape of Tower 12, barely visible over the darkening blanket of green. Was that a gunshot? Another night. Another goddamn night stuck in this window-lined prison. At least I have a good view, so I guess that's something. The storm raged all night again last night, and only lit up just before dawn. At one point, the winds were gusting hard enough to rock the tower, which was a bit disconcerting, to say the least. As I stand out on the wet catwalk around my shack, I see that the clouds haven't let us go just yet, though, and look every bit as pissed off as they did yesterday afternoon. It seems like the dry season has come to an end, which is good, since I've been slacking a bit on my fire-watching duties over the last couple of days. Hmm, gallows humour, right? It's either that, or sitting in the corner in a fetal position, crying. And I've been told by my ex fiance that I'm not an attractive crier. I haven't heard a peep from Billy since his last terrifying broadcast to me yesterday. I've tried to reach him several times since then, but no dice. I've also tried reaching Nathan and the ranger station, but all I get is static, even from my base radio set. When I first started here, I remember Billy telling me during my brief orientation that the radio should be able to reach about 50 miles or so, so I'm not sure what's going on. Update. I just took a quick look at the base station and found that the cable leading up to the antenna on the roof of the shack is now just a dangly thing swaying in the breeze. The storm must have decided it needed the antenna more than I did because it's gone. I can see where the screws were torn out of the wooden mast. And before you say anything about whatever this thing is that's been stalking around, deciding to sabotage my radio, I should probably tell you that the wooden antenna mast looks like it's been around for a long time. The wood was probably dry rotted to begin with. And now that it's soaked, it crumbled away in little wet brown bits as soon as I probed at it with my fingers. Speaking of whatever this kuatami or angler thing is, I'm just going to call it a mimic, I think. 
I haven't heard or sensed anything weird since yesterday. I'm assuming it's still out there somewhere, but I don't think it's nearby. If it's still anywhere around here, it's probably somewhere over near Tower 12. Or at least, that's what makes the most sense to me, anyway. Which brings me to my shiny new lunatic idea. My jeep. It can't be more than a mile down the northern track, still sitting there in front of that fallen pine. I could probably get to it in less than an hour, even with the wet and muddy ground. It had almost a full tank of gas, and I'm pretty sure I could outrun this mimic thing in it if I can get onto a straight shot of service road. I definitely don't relish the idea, mind you. Every instinct is screaming at me to sit my butt right where I am in this tower. I know that the ranger station will start getting a little antsy when Billy doesn't check in after a few days. But I'm also thinking they may extend it out a day or two in light of the foul weather. Maybe five days at the outside, and then I'll have a ranger truck parked outside my tower. The question is, what will they find when they get here? See, I've been thinking about it. Billy definitely knew more about this thing than I do. Certainly enough to not open the door for it when we heard it outside pretending to be a Girl Scout selling cookies. That makes me think that maybe the fence and the trap door might not be enough to stop it if it really wants in. As pan-shittingly terrifying as the prospect of leaving the tower and making for the jeep is, Sitting here cornered in my window-lined shack, just waiting for it to show up in the middle of the night, is even worse. At least I have a chance out there. I still have the Magnum. It's been holstered on my belt since yesterday. They don't issue pea shooters for bear protection out here. This thing is the most powerful handgun in mass production. It'll put down anything in North America, as long as you can hit it right. Any normal animal, anyway. Who knows what this thing is capable of. Still, it does provide a level of comfort and gives me some confidence that my plan may work, if luck's on my side. For now, I'm going to try and eat a granola bar to put something in my churning stomach and try to build a little energy. I don't think I've eaten anything since early yesterday. After that... I'm grabbing my pack and heading out. Wish me luck. I left my tower shortly after 10am, and let me tell you, those were some of the most difficult first steps I've ever taken in my life. Stepping out through the chain link gate into the open space beyond my small compound felt like I was stepping off the roof of a skyscraper. When I closed the gate behind me, I just stood there motionless, for what must have been five minutes, frozen in place with my hand clenching the grip of the revolver, still holstered at my belt. Even with all the stress and anxiety swirling around in my head, I was amazed at exactly how keen my senses seemed in that moment. It felt like I could hear every rustle of leaves and smell every damp patch of moss in the thousands of acres of wilderness surrounding me. In that moment... I felt very small, very insignificant, trivial. When my chest began to ache, I realized that I had been holding a breath in, subconsciously afraid to make even the slightest sound. I lit it out slowly and forced myself to breathe normally again. Scanning the trees, I turned slowly in a circle, eyes searching for anything that seemed out of place, like it didn't belong but there was nothing there. Everything seemed normal, at least to me. Casting one last look over my shoulder at the refuge of my tower, I started off along the seldom-used service road to the north, careful of my footing on the muddy and uneven ground. I allowed myself to move at a slow jog, fast enough to make good progress, but not so fast that I was announcing my presence to the world. Not so fast that I couldn't hear the forest around me over my own breathing. 
I stopped a couple of times during my trek to catch my breath and take a drink of water, and thankfully still seemed alone and unpursued for now. I wondered if it was out there somewhere, among the dense trees, hiding in the muted grey shadows of the forest. Maybe it was looking for me at that moment. Perhaps it had returned to my tower in my absence, found it empty, and was even now tracking my flight along its trail. If I paused long enough, would I see it suddenly rounding the gentle curve behind me, as it caught up? Or did it prefer to move more stealthily, among the trees and underbrush, laying in wait alongside the path ahead, ready for my approach? I had to forcibly shake myself out of that line of thought. It wasn't doing me any good now. I was committed to my plan. The thought of retracing my steps and returning to my lonely watchtower held just as much terror, because now it sat there unmanned, unwatched, abandoned. For all I know, the mimic could be there at this very moment, ransacking my shack. I definitely didn't want to walk back in on that little scene, I can promise you that much. I ended up making surprisingly good time on that northern path. It was only about 30 minutes before I saw the dim shape of my jeep, waiting dutifully in the middle of the path ahead. The matte tan paint job and black cloth roof stood out remarkably well against the muted greens and browns of the surrounding forest. Urging my pace to quicken, I covered the last hundred yards before I even realized it and found myself standing at the door, hand on handle. I paused. A chill ran down my spine, inciting an unbidden shiver. I realized then how quiet the forest around me was, and wasn't sure how long it had been this way. I felt that something was out of place, and so did the native fauna. On any given day, the trees were alive with the sounds of wildlife. Squirrels and chipmunks chittered, insects buzzed, and a thousand varieties of birds called and sang from the treetops. Not now, though. It was as if they had all left, and I felt very alone in that moment. Only, not quite alone. Something out there, in that sea of trees. Something stalked. Something that didn't belong in the light of day. Something that didn't belong under the watchful eyes of Mother Nature. I was pretty sure she wouldn't have let something like the Mimic evolve, had it not been hidden in its underground realm. The door of the jeep was thankfully quiet as I depressed the latch and swung it open. If this had been a horror movie, I'm sure an ear-splitting screech would have erupted from its hinges. But in real life, we tend to take care of these vehicles pretty well. In the best of times, they are the only convenient transportation for 20 miles or more. In times like this though, it was likely the only thing that would save my sorry ass. I jumped in and pulled the door shut behind me with a dull funk, subconsciously locking it. I almost laughed aloud when I did that. The entire top of the jeep was nothing more than canvas and plastic windows. A feisty hamster could probably have penetrated my little haven. I doubt the Mimic would even think twice about it. The jeep fired up immediately when I turned the key in the ignition, and I threw it in reverse for the most ungraceful 14-point turn you've ever seen on the narrow and muddy service road. Once I got turned around, I didn't waste any time directing it back the way I'd come. The service road was really little more than an uneven and ill-maintained dirt trail, and was only ever used infrequently by the rangers and lookouts. As I'd previously mentioned, it was a rough ride, even for the heavy suspension of my trusty steed, so I had to keep it at a reasonable speed. The very last thing I needed was to snap an axle, or bounce myself right off the road and into the trees. Compound the condition of the trail with the fact that it constantly wound and curved as it progressed, and it meant that even my best speed wasn't too much faster than I could run on foot. That's okay. Once I got past my tower, 
the service road was generally better maintained and followed a more or less straight path. I'd be able to build some decent speed there, and I'd be out of the wilderness and standing at the ranger station in an hour or so. The abrupt appearance of my tower caused me to feather off the gas as I rounded the last curve from the northern track. I slowed to a crawl and squinted through the now dirty windshield. From here, everything looked exactly like I had left it. The gate still stood closed and, looking up, I could see the trap door also appeared shut. Maybe this thing hadn't returned. Hell, maybe this thing wasn't ever going to return. For all I knew, it was headed in the opposite direction. It's not like it had GPS or anything like that. It was at that moment that I nearly pissed myself when the radio still clipped to my belt squawked and I heard probably the last thing I had expected to hear. Billy. John, are you there? The signal was pretty clear, but his voice sounded weak, strained. I almost didn't respond. I was frozen, indecision clouding my mind. I didn't know what I could trust to be true, but I doubted that this mimic had read the radio manual and learned to operate the handset. I snatched the handset from my shoulder and keyed the mic. Billy? Uh, Holy shit, is that you? He answered me right away, and I thought I could hear the relief in his tone, buried under his pained words. John, thank God. I was afraid you were gone. My eyes drifted to the trail leading past my tower, toward the ranger station, toward safety. Another five minutes and I would have been, Billy. I've got my jeep, and I was just about to haul ass for the ranger station. I replied, What's your status? There was a moment of silence, and I wondered briefly if he'd even heard me. But then he answered, I'm not doing too hot, John. I'm in my tower, but that thing hurt me. I've lost a bit of blood and have been drifting in and out. I've patched myself up as best I could, but uh, I can't stop the bleeding from my leg. I frowned and closed my eyes a moment, asking a question that I was pretty sure I knew the answer to. Are you able to get to your jeep? I thought I heard a coughing bark of laughter before he answered. I don't think so. I'm pretty banged up. What happened, Billy? The son of a bitch got into my tower. I managed to get off a shot at it, but not before it got the jump on me. He explained. It took off before it did me in, so I think I hit it. I don't know where it is now, though. My tower is wide open, though, and it hasn't come back, so maybe it's dead. I doubted that. Things never work out that simple. Are you stable, Billy? Can you be moved? Another silence, and then... I know what you're thinking, John. Turn your jeep east and haul ass to the ranger station. That's an order. I dropped my forehead to the steering wheel closing my eyes and cursing. It would have been easier if Billy hadn't radioed me. I know it's selfish. I know I'm an asshole for even thinking it, but I could have been blissfully out of range if he had only just waited another ten minutes. I could still put the throttle down and get out of here. I could still race for the ranger station and have them mobilize a chopper to come back for Billy. But they were at least an hour away. Factor in the spin-up and travel time for the helicopter, and you're talking more like an hour and a half before anyone gets to him. He didn't sound good. Something told me it was unlikely he would last that amount of time. I could still turn left. I'd likely live, but could I live with myself, knowing that I left Billy to die alone in his tower? What if our situations had been reversed? Sure. I might be saying the same words as he was saying now, 
but in my heart, I'd be pleading for him to come and save me. I couldn't imagine being in his position, lying there, hurt and bleeding out, knowing that his safe haven was wide open, and that the thing was out there somewhere. Look, I know what you're going to say. I know that you're probably already saying it. Don't be a dumbass. This is exactly why everyone dies in horror movies. I get it. Believe me, I get it. But this isn't a movie. And my friend was lying there, dying in his shack. If I could get to him, and get him into the jeep, we could both be out of here, leaving all this twisted nightmare bullshit behind us. Billy, I'm headed your way. Get ready, because we're going to wrestle you down the stairs and into my jeep as quickly as we can. I said, cranking the wheels to the right and taking the western trail with more speed than I should have. John, I gave you an order. Get out of here, now. Despite the situation, I managed a sardonic grin as my rig bucked and bounced over the uneven trail. Billy, I'd like to take this opportunity to officially tender my resignation from the Firewatch. Now shut your mouth and conserve your strength. I'll be there in 15 minutes. 15 minutes turned out to be a pretty good guess. And before long I skidded to a halt outside Tower 12, next to Billy's ride. I opened the door and stepped out into the quiet air. My handgun coming out of its holster and held before me like some sort of shield. I took a quick moment to let my eyes roam over the surrounding woodlands for any sign of movement, before quickly jogging around my jeep and towards the compound's entrance. I passed through the open doorway, taking note of the heavy chain-link gate that was laying twisted 15 feet inside of the fence. Another dozen paces, and I was at the base of the stairs, craning my neck to make sure nothing was awaiting me above. I keyed the mic at my shoulder and said in a low voice, Billy, I'm outside of your tower right now, heading up. For Christ's sake, don't shoot me. I turned the volume on the speaker down just in time for his response. Damn it, John. I told you to leave. But despite his words, the gratitude and relief were clear in his tone. I started up the stairs, revolver still held at the ready as my other hand ran lightly along the railing. My eyes were drawn to the red-black spots, staining the grey paint of the steel steps. I found even more of the viscous fluid on the railing as I continued my ascent. Blood. But not Billy's. Good. I hope that fucker is laying in the woods, breathing its last breath. He definitely hit it, but I had no way of telling how seriously it was hurt. In a human, bright red blood indicated an arterial bleed, which was typically a fairly significant injury. With this thing, who knew what black red meant? I climbed the rest of the staircase as it wound around the tower and stopped just below the open trap door. Billy? I called out cautiously. A pause. Then came his reply. Shaky, and with a wheezing sound that I didn't like at all. How do I know it's you? Say something that this fucker couldn't have heard you say before. I've always admired and respected you. I answered without hesitation. Asshole, he said under his breath. Come on up. I took another couple steps, cautiously poking my head through the trap door. Billy was sitting upright, more or less, resting his back against the door frame of his shack and aiming his own handgun generally in my direction. As soon as he saw my face, he dropped his hand to his side, the stainless steel barrel clanging against the metal walkway. As I stepped fully through the trap door, I noticed two things immediately. Firstly, there was a significant amount of that black-red ooze splattered around. Secondly, 
I realized how badly Billy was injured. His face had gone grey with a sickly paleness, and his breath came in ragged hitches. Blood-soaked bandages wrapped both forearms, and the side of his face was covered with a crimson rag, taped haphazardly down. His entire khaki park shirt was painted in a hellish tie-dye of shades of red, but it was his leg that worried me most. A tourniquet had been tied around his thigh near his groin, but the pants leg was a cherry red below that, and was glistening in the late morning light. Jesus, Billy, I exclaimed, holstering my gun and rushing to his side. He waved me off as I knelt beside him. I know, I know, it looks bad. Save it for later. Let's get out of here before that thing decides to come back for another round. I nodded and stood again, taking a quick glance past him and into his shack. A twin to my own tower normally. Billy's looked like a war zone now. His table and desk had both been overturned and smashed, along with his base set radio. On the floor nearby was a satellite phone, its antenna and display obviously smashed during the attack. Lifting his arm over my head, I helped him to his feet. He grimaced in pain, but threw his remaining strength in with mine, and we began the precarious descent through the trap door. Did you at least get to make your phone call? I asked him, as we took the steps carefully and agonizingly slow. He shook his head. It got here just as I was getting ready to. It was using your voice, telling me that you were from the park service, and that you were here to help. He looked at me with a shaken astonishment. It sounded just like you, John. But when I looked over the catwalk railing down at it, he winced again as we half stumbled on a step. Almost there. John, he continued. Holy hell, I've never seen anything like it. I shook my head as we reached the bottom step and moved onto the rain-soaked ground and grunted with exertion. Save it, Billy. We've got a long ride ahead of us. Plenty of time for that later. He just nodded as I manoeuvred him around the passenger side of my jeep and helped him climb in. Once he was in, I hurried back around to the driver's door and got in, starting the engine as I pulled the door closed behind me. Throwing it into reverse, I felt the wheels break loose as I stepped on the gas with a bit too much enthusiasm. I swung the 4x4 around and put it into drive, pointing it back towards my tower and beyond safety. I only had a heartbeat's warning from Billy before I saw it, barreling from the underbrush at us. It threw itself, a great mass, crashing into the side of the jeep, and Billy scrambled to get away from it, damn near climbing over the center console in the process and knocking my hands off the wheel in his panic. The jeep swung wildly left, and I stomped down on the brakes to avoid careening off into the trees. One of the front wheels dipped off the road, and the steel bumper crashed through a small cluster of oak saplings, halting us abruptly and stalling the engine. Everything went silent in that moment as we froze. My breath hitched in my lungs, and my eyes widened in shock. As I laid eyes upon this abomination for the first time, my first impression was that it was much larger than I had thought but the nightmare visage before me eclipsed such a pedestrian observation. The thing stood in the middle of the trail still, shaking its head as if trying to recover its senses after the collision with the two-ton vehicle. It looked vaguely humanoid in a sense, but it walked on four limbs, clearly proportioned to such a task. It was hairless and with mottled pink-gray skin, stretched tightly over muscles, bones, and odd, unidentifiable bulges. Their limbs seemed to have joints that bent in all the wrong directions, and ended in what should have been claws. But instead of the distinctive keratin-composed sharp nails that seemed so familiar in the natural world, 
These seemed to be extensions of the creature's skeletal structure, protruding painfully through its veiny translucent hide. But worst of all, was the bulbous and disproportionately large head that topped an oddly gaunt-appearing neck. It was oblong, and reminded me of the shape of a feline skull in general appearance. Its maw seemed a jagged tear across its face, with ill-fitting and chaotically positioned teeth that didn't seem to allow the mouth to close properly. I couldn't see any eyes, but where they should have been were instead two bulbous and cyst-like organs, seeming to bulge and flatten in a slow rhythm, as if bladders filling with air or liquid. I reeled back in revulsion as it turned its sightless head in our direction, searchingly. Flaps of skin on either side of its malformed snout opened slowly like some obscene blossom composed of milky grey bat wings, and I had the sense that it was using them to try to somehow locate us. It was then I saw where Billy's shot had struck the creature in the face. One of the snout flaps was nearly completely severed, hanging limply in contrast to its sibling, and a gouge furrowed by the bullet's travel ceased along the right side of the thing's head, piercing and ravaging the bulbous organ on that side and leaving it a deflated sack. When it turned its head further in our direction, I could see clearly where it had bled significantly from the shot, but was horrified to see that the wound had already sealed itself and a shiny silver scar was left to mark the incident. I knew I hit you, you bastard, Billy whispered, half to himself. The mimic stopped its motion, and we watched as the uninjured bladder on its head expanded like a half-filled party balloon. It dipped its head a bit and we saw two membranous slits in the top of its skull dilate. A moment later, the twisted sound of a human voice assaulted our ears. I know you're out here. The voice was unmistakably Billy's, but was distorted and wrong. I thought that the wound from his gunshot probably had something to do with that. The thing raised its head again, turning a bit more in our direction, and took a few experimental steps forward. Again, it paused and lowered its head. This time we heard what sounded like the pained roar of a bear, almost perfectly replicated, except for that same distortion that we had heard previously. Had this thing killed a bear? I held my breath as we watched it again, raise its head and take a few more contemplative steps in our direction, slowly swinging its grotesque snout back and forth. I could see how the flaps of skin that were flared open where its nose should have been twitched manually back and forth, and I felt like it was using them to listen for us. It knows we're here, somewhere, but it can't see us, whispered Billy, leaning close. But if it gets close enough, I'm thinking we're done for. I looked over at Billy and realized that there was no way he'd be able to make a run for it in his condition. From the look of the thing growing ever closer to where we cowered in the jeep, I thought it was likely we didn't have much time before it got close enough to hear our breathing, or heartbeats, or whatever, even inside the 4 by 4 when that happened, I knew what would come next. Billy closed his eyes a moment and turned to me. There was something in his eyes then. Some sort of acceptance that I didn't like one bit. Get ready with that cannon. He whispered. You're only going to get one chance at this fucker. What are you talking about? I asked. A moment later, I had my answer. Billy took a deep breath and mustered every bit of his strength, flinging the door open and staggering out of the jeep. I'm right here, asshole. He shouted at the thing, limping weakly across the road away from the jeep. The mimic whipped its head in his direction instantly, 
but tilted its head to the side. Seemingly momentarily puzzled at this unexpected turn of events. Billy held his own magnum in his hand, but he was too weak to raise it towards the beast. Still, he pulled the trigger, and a resounding boom seemed to shake the air. The mimic flinched at the deafening sound of the gunshot, the flaps of membrane at its snout snapping shut protectively, but its stunned hesitation didn't last very long. In an instant, faster than I would have thought possible, it launched itself on powerful limbs at Billy, knocking him to the ground and tearing at him with teeth and claws. I heard my friend start screaming then, a horrible, soul-rending sound that I'll never forget for as long as I live. But now was my chance, and I took it. I swung the door open and stepped out of the jeep, my gun coming free of its holster in the same movement. The creature was preoccupied with what was left of Billy, but as soon as I brought the gun up and thumbed back the hammer, its head whipped around at me. It crouched like a compressed spring as it prepared to launch, but I was quicker. The report of the gunshot was incredible, and the recoil of the powerful round rocked my wrist back painfully. The beast staggered, and I saw a burst of blood and tissue explode from the wound near where its shoulder met its neck. It howled an otherworldly cry, sounding like a bedlam mixture of man and beast. But though the wound seemed terrible, it tried once again to throw itself at me. I was set in my course though, and took step after step towards the creature, pulling the trigger again and again, until the gun ran dry, and all I was left with was the clicking of the hammer and the high-pitched ringing in my ears. The acrid smell of gunpowder stung my nose, and by the time I finally stopped, I found myself within only a few feet of the horrid thing. Six blackened holes stifled the neck and torso of the creature where the bullets had entered, and I knew that the destruction of their exits on the opposite side would be far worse. The mimic lay sprawled across the ruined body of Billy Johnson, its weight crushing whatever had been left of my friend. Black-red blood spread out from the beneath the thing's bulk, like an oil spill across a smooth floor. I noted with some muted surprise that the creature still twitched and slowly flexed its powerful muscles, and a wheezing sound was quietly emanating from the slits on the top of its skull. I holstered my empty handgun and scanned around the sodden ground for what I knew was there. A moment later I spotted it. Billy's own magnum, laying half buried in the muck where it had been torn from his grip under the weight of the monster. I snatched it up and shook it clear of most of the mud and grass. Opening the cylinder, I saw that only one unfired round remained. That was enough though. I approached the horror before me without apprehension or pause. My eyes focused on the thing that had caused such pain and terror. I thumbed the hammer back and placed the muzzle against the mimic's head, which still convulsed with small remaining life. I didn't know if it would be able to heal from the wounds I had already inflicted. Logic told me it was unlikely, but the silvery scar I had seen from Billy's previous encounter caused me to question everything I thought was possible. I felt the tremors from the creature vibrate through the gun as the barrel rested against its skull, right between where its eyes should have been. I tensed my finger on the cool steel of the trigger, and the crack of the gunshot echoed through the forest. It was done. But even as I walked back numbly to the jeep and restarted the engine, I wondered if that was true. I thought back to the journal I had read, written more than a hundred and thirty years before, and how it had alluded to tales of this creature going back long before then. 
as I drove the jeep along the rough and winding service road. I wondered at the possibility that what we encountered was the only one of its kind. That this same beast had somehow terrorized cultures separated from each other by great time and distance, spawning the legends that the author of the journal and his companions had pursued. It didn't seem likely. And now, the door was open. Hello, sinister listeners. If you've enjoyed this story, then you'll find all the author's information in the description below. For more content, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to succumb to the sinister.